good. Here's the record. This is a little dark, and we so got a light. Techcast, a live internet radio show offering the latest Hello. news and interviews with the people driving business. Andre is trying to get into the waiting room in Michigan. Now, your hosts, Matt Roush and Mike Brennan. Hey, it's Matt Roush and Mike Brennan. And after a week off, we are back uh, with another edition of the M Squared Techcast or MI Tech News TV. All right, yes. Uh, and so we have uh, Enrico uh, Schaefer, who, gosh, been doing stuff with us for how long, Enrico? Um, Too many years to count. Many <laughs> years. Back oh, when we remember when getting, drones were a Andrea, new thing. We Andrea is on the next segment, so there we go. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, anyway, so what we were going to talk about, we've been, as you know, since mid-March is uh, COVID-19 themed stuff. Um and so when uh, I approached you about coming on the show, I said, do you have something that can fit into that box? And you said, indeed, I do. And so you've been handling some cases with, now I'm not sure what the term STR stands for. Short-term uh, short rental. Short-term rental. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, so uh, you're specifically working with some clients in the Airbnb space, and I watched your YouTube video, and I'm not a lawyer, so it got a little complicated for me. So I'm hoping you can simplify the situation on what's going on. Obviously, a lot of people, for instance, when I book an Airbnb, I tend to book it well in advance, and then they require money well in advance. Yeah. Well, you know, and then suddenly we have COVID-19, so explain. So exactly. So what happened is a lot of people had reserved reservations on Airbnb, and so you've got three parties. You've got the host who owns the property, who does all the work, right? You've got the traveler or the guest who's booking the property, and then you've got the platform, Airbnb. And what happened is that um, the hosts have the ability to choose the cancellation policy, and then the travelers have the ability to pick a flexible cancellation, a moderate, or a strict. And a strict cancellation policy, no refunds. Actually, it's a 50-50 split of the refund, but if you're within 14 days or so, then it's 0% refund. But right. if you cancel long enough, you get you split that risk 50-50 with the, with the host. So when COVID came along, Airbnb, as you might recall, was just on the cusp of uh, filing with the SEC for um, an IPO, right, which they were going to do in May. So when, when all of a sudden COVID happened, Airbnb decided they were going to ignore the cancellation policies of the hosts and refund what was initially like a billion dollars and now is like $3 billion in Ooh. reservations Ooh. to the travelers, despite the fact that the travelers and the host had already agreed to split that 50-50, right? And of course, why did Airbnb do that? Because it has an IPO coming up and it wants those travelers to come back to them, not to VRBO, not to booking.com, who honored the contract between the host and the guest. Now, Airbnb is just asking, uh, they're acting as an escrow agent for that money. They have no interest in it. So for them to come and say, you know what, we as the escrow get to decide whether or not we're going to refund that and override the strict cancellation policy is a problem for a lot of hosts who are, by the way, dealing with it with their guests directly before Airbnb stepped in to mess everything up. So there's about $2 billion worth of host claims out there. Mm. Uh, and we're handling those claims for Airbnb hosts, property managers using Airbnb, et cetera. Wow. So where does that stand? I mean, how long has it been going on and where is the case now? <clears throat> so the, so this, this is where the tech aspect comes in, right? Because Airbnb, like all other platforms, has a no class action clause, no collective action and arbitration clause, and you must arbitrate using consumer arbitration any claims that you have with them. So Airbnb's uh, model is under the terms, you have to file individual consumer arbitrations. So we've been doing this for three months. We have hundreds of hosts. We're trying to get to 10,000 hosts filing 10,000 arbitrations on the 
choke on this model because 10,000 arbitrations to Airbnb is at least $100 million, if not $300 million, just in transaction costs, not to mention the $2 billion in liability they already have. So um, we're basically taking the position that hosts, you do have power. If you act collectively to assert your individual rights, you can bring Airbnb to its knees. And that's what we're doing. And we're well on our way to making that happen. Hmm. <laughs> So, so how are you uh, um, contacting these hosts? Are you uh, advertising for this or, or you know, how is this being handled? So uh, I, I'm a host, which is how I got involved. And I happen to know this space really well. So it was a perfect combination for me. But as a host, I'm the one that got the email from Airbnb apologizing the day after they told all the guests you can get refunds. With, they did it without even telling the host, right? So I immediately looked at the terms of service and I saw that the terms of service had a exception where Airbnb could in fact refund money called the extenuating circumstances policy. And in it, it said, one of the reasons they can give a refund is an endemic, E-N-D-E-M-I-C. And I thought, well, what's an endemic? And I looked it up and it's the opposite of a pandemic. Huh. So Airbnb specifically excluded pandemics from a refund event. And I thought, okay, well, that, that, that's a breach of the terms. Four days later, I went back to look at it again, and all of a sudden it said pandemic. So Airbnb changed the terms of service, didn't provide any notice that they required 30 days notice under the terms of service, then pretended as though the, the, the extenuating circumstance policy always said pandemic, hid that change, and then tried to apply this new policy retroactively to existing reservations. Well, at that point, I was all in, right? Because it was breach, it was fraud, it was you name it. And so these hosts, to answer your question, uh, Matt, they're just finding us. I did a blog post on the endemic issue and it just really got picked up heavily in the press and with hosts and social media. And all of a sudden, um, Enrico Schaefer was the champion of Airbnb hosts, finally fighting back against the big evil platform. Okay. Wow. And well, this is, I mean, this, this became kind of personal for me. I was, I was off last week and my wife and I had planned this really epic, like 11 day road trip where we're going to drive to Montreal and then we're going to go to Maine and then we're going to come back through uh, Niagara Falls. And, um, you know, we had Airbnbs in both the, you know, historic section of Montreal and, and in a little lake in Maine. And when we canceled, uh, we canceled like six weeks before the trip. And Airbnb said, well, we, we'll give you half your money back in cash or all of your money back in Airbnb credit that you have to use by the end of 2021. Well, we opted for Airbnb credit. And uh, instead, last week, we just drove three, four hours. We just drove three, four hours to northern Michigan and rented a cabin, you know, well, and, I'm glad and, you and did used that. the credit to do that. So Because most of those credits will go unused. So think about that. That's part of the fraud that Airbnb um, engaged in because they have no interest in the payouts that belong to hosts. They hold that money in escrow, right? So when right. they gave the refunds, they didn't tell the travelers like you, oh, by the way, you can have a refund. What they did is they pressured and created a funnel which pushed you into a travel credit, which industry standard is 50% never get used. Yeah. That means Airbnb now has well, I'm my host use mine, payout, I can tell you that. <laughs> right? Yeah. They have my host payout, which they converted, stole from me, if it goes unused and then with the travelers, you know, they made this big public relations that they refunded all the money. And the reality is most of the people, most of the guests went through a bunch of screens, which pushed them into a travel credit and buried the refund link at the bottom. So they weren't yeah. doing guests any favor either. And our view is like, if Airbnb wanted $2 billion worth of goodwill with travelers, they should have paid for it themselves. They should have used host money to do it. Hmm. Interesting. So I, I don't host uh, folks, uh, so I don't know the intricacies. So how does that actually work for a host? They, uh, when someone books a uh, unit, as it were, then how, how much goes to Airbnb? How much goes to the host? How does that all play out? So Airbnb takes a fee from both the host and the guest in order to use the platform. So I can't remember what the percentages are, but it's not insignificant. Um, 
you know, it's billions of dollars per year that hosts pay to Airbnb for using the platform. And it's billions of dollars by travelers who pay to book through the platform. And so they have a fee that they have an interest in on both sides of the transaction. And then the reservation amount, the payout to the host, they just hold as a, as a, a fiduciary, as an escrow agent for the transaction between the host and the guest. Okay. Huh. So, sounds a little bit like what Ticketmaster does then. Yeah. And look at So the other piece of this is that a lot of platforms really had this, this problem, you know, booking.com and VRBO, they didn't give any refunds. So for Airbnb, this was a great opportunity for them to use host money to buy a bunch of goodwill with travelers that, on the basis that they, they paid refunds. They didn't pay anything, right? They, they may have waived their, their fee. But, um, but a lot of different platforms had this problem when COVID hit of revenue. And to the extent that they were cycling someone else's money, all of a sudden they didn't have enough money to pay the people that they owed. And so we're, we're really seeing a, a big uptick in, in these consumer arbitrations across all platforms. Hmm. And think about this. This will be the first time where users of a platform fought back collectively against a platform because users are, are powerless, right? They're all, they're all their rights are taken away in the terms of service. They can't bring a class action. Those are enforceable, those class action waivers. So what are they supposed to do? Well, our view is if you, if you are smart about it, you can actually, you're bigger than Airbnb as hosts, right? As long as you're acting mm -hmm. collectively. And then you can really get a seat at the table. From our point of view, our own table, we just want a seat at it to be able to create accountability and transparency. Okay, uh, I feel a little over a minute or so left. So why don't you talk a little bit about uh, how folks can reach out to you if they're Airbnb posts and they want to get involved. Now, is this sort of turned into a class action lawsuit essentially, or what is it? Well, it's not because they're barred under the terms of service, but it is in the sense that we're acting collectively through individual arbitration. So we're filing, you know, we represent hundreds of hosts. We're filing dozens and dozens of arbitrations um, every every month. And so by doing these individually, we're, we're following the rules that they set, but driving transaction fees to Airbnb that'll be in the hundreds of millions of dollars. So if you want to contact me, you can go to traverselegal.com. Traverselegal.com is in Traverse City, T-R-A-V-E-R-S-E, legal.com. You'll find we have a whole page on Airbnb and the COVID refund uh, issue. Okay. Okay. Are you still doing, uh, just real quick here before we part, are you still doing drone law or uh, has that sort of gone by the wayside? No, drones are hot right now because, of course, they are social distance distancing type, you know, hardware software platform. So you can do a lot with a drone that doesn't require you to get close to something or someone. And so now we're seeing a lot of activity in that space as we start to look to drones to help solve our, our COVID risk. We'll have to get you back in August and you can talk about that. We haven't talked about drones in I don't know, a year or so, I guess. Right? Probably a while. Yeah. So all right, my good friend Enrico Schaefer, thanks for being with us today. And by the way, Enrico does have an office in Detroit. I'm giving you a shameless plug, by the way. Thank uh, you. And but although he's based in Traverse City, I'll be up there in the summer, but Detroit in the winter, right? You got it. I, I try and steal my, uh, oh, I got to stay up north another week. But we're down in the uh, Tech Town area in Midtown in Detroit in our Detroit office. All right, sounds great. So we'll be right back uh, with another guest. This is Mike Brennan. And it's Matt Roush. And you've been watching MI Tech News TV. And uh, we'll be, like I say, right back. As a Lawrence Technological University Thanks graduate, you're not Thanks only smart, you're worth more. Thank you very much. Yes, more. Thanks, According to PayScale.com, when it comes to graduate salaries, LTU is in America's top 100. This be invaluable, be yours, more. Man. At LTU, yep, yep, possible yep. is everything. Salaries of Lawrence Tech grads are among the highest of any university in America. Plan a campus visit to meet with counselors, faculty, and coaches. Why wait? Find out more at ltu.edu. 
Lawrence Technological University graduates earn a degree and a higher starting salary. In fact, when it comes to earning potential, the Brookings Institution ranks LTU fifth among U.S. colleges and universities. Be enriched. Be more. At LTU, possible is everything. Salaries of Lawrence Tech grads are among the highest of any university in America. Plan a campus visit to meet with counselors, faculty, and coaches. Why wait? Find out more at ltu.edu. Hey, it's hey, Mike it's, Brennan. And it's Matt Roush. <laughs> we never get that right. <laughs> well, you know, we're not in the same studio, so we can't just point at each other and say, you That's take it. it. No right? more nudging or kicking or anything like that. We're, yeah, we're, right. what, 40 miles apart. So yeah, uh, it, would, it would have to be an elbow bump now, I guess. So Yeah, right. that's true. Yeah, I can't do that. So I uh, want you to introduce your guest. I know she's affiliated with LTU, so we'll give you that shameless plug there. But go yes, ahead and indeed. talk a little uh, bit about what uh, what's going on. Right. To, back when I first started at Lawrence Tech in 2016, uh, that fall we opened the Detroit Center for Design and Technology, which is um, basically a place where we do all of our Detroit-centric activities at LTU. Uh, we do a lot of design classes there. We have a really neat studio there, several studios, in fact, of architecture and design students. Uh, we do exhibitions, we do community events, we do a lot of community outreach. And the manager of the DCDT is with us today, Andrea Bogart. So welcome, Andrea. Thank you for having me. Nice sure. to see you in person. I've heard your name and LTU, but it's nice to see you. Yeah, absolutely, you too. Um, so we have a new, um, Basically, it was, it was scheduled to be, obviously, before the pandemic hit, an in-person series of events this summer uh, centered around the impact of climate change and sustainability and how the built environment uh, uh, sort of affects that. And uh, I, I love the title of it, so why don't we start out with uh, the title of it, which is, Yeah, What Lester Said. So why sure. don't we start out with, who, who is Lester? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. So just step back a bit. So uh, we are the College of Architecture and Design, the DCDT, um, and working with the architects, our professors and so forth, and just living in this world, um, understanding that climate change is a huge issue. We wanted to tackle it in a way that um, you know, was appropriate for our college, but also extremely important. So Lester Brown uh, has been called one of the great pioneer environmentalists. And he actually uh, pioneered the concept of sustainable development. Um, he was presented in 1987 with the United Nations Environmental Prize. Um, he's one of the Marquis Who's Who, Greatest 50 Americans. And he, re he was really the person that started us talking about climate change and introduced the concept. So um, Christopher Stefani, our associate director at the Detroit Center for Design and Technology thought quoting him and bringing his name into it would, would help connect it to people who really understood who he was. Okay, so uh, talk about a, a little bit some of the online events that are coming up. I know there's an exhibition, I know there's a lecture series. So we, yes. We launched, so obviously as I'm the a curator of our Woodward Gallery as well as our quarter gallery up on the second floor. And I'm an artist and I'm a curator and we got to get work in person, right? Well, we can't do that. And we started working on this project. I work with um, the American Institute of Architects, Michigan chapter, 2030 District Detroit. Um, and they were part of the team putting this together as well as Jan Colbert, son of AC3. Um, who is also who is a District 2030 leader in uh, Ann Arbor. There are team members. We've been working since January on this. I brought them in because they are experts in those in the areas that they do. I also brought in um, the um, Wright Museum because they did green infrastructure. So they were also at the table and I needed experts that did different areas. I'm not a climate change expert. I am manager of the DCDT. So we've been working since January thinking, all right, this is going to be in person. It's going to be great. And then of course the, pande the pandemic hit and then we, like all other organizations, had to figure out how we were going to move this easily online. And there's a lot of, lot of events, a lot of moving parts. The exhibit was easiest because that's of course visual. It's not as good to be just visual in front, you know, just 2D in front of work. You want to be 3D, but the work is spectacular. There's um, audio, there is documentaries, there's obviously 2D work. We also have on our page, it's Detroit.design backslash backslash Lester. 
we have not only the exhibition, we also have um, AA and Michigan boards. So what architecture firms are doing sustainable projects, you can find that in the drop down. And then we have a, a net zero um, home reconstruction in Ann Arbor. One of our artists reconstructed a home. So his path and all the images are also in our in our exhibit. We have two and a half months worth of programming. The first mm. was the uh, art exhibit launch, which, is on, which was on June 1st. Then we had uh, kind of a meet and greet with Districts 2030 Ann Arbor, Grand Rapids, and Detroit. That presentation is, uh, I grabbed and put that in our blog. The last event we did virtually that we stream through social media. So it's not just you have to have a Zoom link and get in, we stream it to the public. It is called, uh, it was called Navigating the Nuts and Bolts of uh, Stormwater Infrastructure with the Wright Museum and the Sacred Heart Church and all the experts that uh, put together these two projects and how they did it, kind of like case studies for other organizations that were interested in doing this green infrastructure on their, um, in their buildings. And AIA Michigan has put together a C CES certification for all architects who um, were included, participated in the events, they can actually, even if they're members or non-members, get certified in these areas. So I'm very grateful to AIA Michigan for doing that. The next event that we have on the calendars is coming Thursday at 4.30 is the artist talk. So we have three artists and the co-curator who are gonna be discussing how these artists, activists from all over the country use their art to raise awareness and to change minds. So that's gonna be fascinating. Right after that on, Ju on July 29th, we have building a carbon neutral world. That is with uh, AC3, um, AI Michigan is going to be moderating that. So how do we get more towards a net zero um, universe? And, you know, I'm talking about all these things without knowing much. So what I want is for you to attend these events. They're free. They're live streamed. Anyone can join. It's really easy. Um, and basically just go to Detroit.design backslash Lester and you can find all of the events and just RSVP and join us for free. And then you get to hear from the experts who know what they're talking about. Well, one, one of the advantages of doing that though is uh, anybody in the world can watch this versus you have to be at the event. Um, that's really the upside to all this. Uh, and uh, I, as we move forward uh, and we hopefully get the pandemic behind us, are you going to be looking at the possibility of doing more of this to serve that worldwide audience? Absolutely. Um, I, I happen to be a tech startup founder, um, although I am an artist and, and physical work is extremely important. It helps to create that relationship, that emotional relationship, and obviously seeing people in, in person also helps build that connection. Being able to expand your reach, you know, you're in marketing, you know that is, is paramount, especially when you're speaking about things that are globally important. Um, we found that our last event, which will be on August 6th, is the path to sustainable fashion. And although this isn't architecture related, we felt that it was a very, very important piece that we wanted to include in this, yeah, what Lester said, um, climate change, because it really is about really protecting our environment. And we have right now, without even promoting it, um, probably about 87 people who have RSVP'd and a lot of them are from overseas. Um, wow. Because fashion is obviously a global thing and this whole fast fashion um, problem that we're having is global. So we, we are getting a lot of people from out of Michigan as well as out of the country signing up. And that's really, that's really exciting to us because we get to bring this conversation to, um, to a broader audience. So yes, when we get back to our normal, um, obviously the gallery will be Whatever open. In fact, is, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we have month of design. We will have in-person events for month of design in Detroit, but we will also be online. So we're working with the artists and the curators to be able to put both of those um, uh, out there so that anyone can see it. Well, I'm hoping one of the things we get back to is not just normal, but better than normal. And uh, sustainability is certainly a part of that. Um, I will admit to being an addict of a cable network called DIY Network. And one of my favorite shows on it is called Building Off the Grid. And it's a, a bunch of people who basically build uh, homes that you don't need to hook up to the utilities. And there are a lot of things about those houses that really aren't that different from, you know, a, a typical house today. So I know, you know, yeah, what Lester said is all about sustainability, but 
you don't have to, I think the message we need to get through to people is that you don't have to give up a ton of creature comforts or give up a ton of money uh, in order to get a lot closer to a net zero built environment, right? It's very true, yes. And, and I think that's one of the ways you have to convince people. It's really, how does it affect them? You know, um, we're seeing a lot of good things happening with the climate because of this pandemic, people doing less things, mm -hmm. people using their cars less, their, um, their carbon footprint has been lowered. So, I mean, I live in Metro Detroit and we back up to a forest. I'm seeing a lot more animals come out, which I happen to love, but it's that getting the person connected to how it's valuable to them. Um, is, is really one of the most important things. And a, a lot of su sustainable nonprofits talk about how much money the average consumer can save if they even just put a curtain, a nice blackout shade in front of their window, how much money it can save them. And, and that affects them personally. So yeah, that sounds like a fabulous um, program that you are involved, that you watch. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Um, so, so talk about, um, some of the other things going on at the DCDT. Um, I, you know, I, I know the college plans to get back to at least some in-person classes this fall, uh, and, and there will be a lot of blended and hybrid classes as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm not privy to that part of it, being the manager. I, I take care of our portion of the building and really run the events, the exhibits. But obviously, I do know that the students are coming back in the fall to our campus. Uh, we are not Southfield. Southfield is the main campus. We have many less um, classes, even in a normal um, uh, semester. So our goal at the DCDT is really to keep the students that are coming to class separated, really just themselves. So we, we can control that, that the conditions. Um, but we do have the exhibits and we do have things that we're really, we're relegating them to one side of the DCDT and we're having the students on the other side and we're, we're coordinating that off so we can really make sure that they're safe and, and also for the people who are our guests that come to our events. You know, that's really important to us is uh, everyone's safety and understanding that we respect them. Okay. Obviously you're making them wear masks. Uh, what else are you making them do? Um, masks, we have, you know, we have um, disinfectant. Um, I haven't been told much else. We're still a little ways away from opening. So the university is determining what it, what it is that the DCDT is going to do with both our students as well as our guests. In terms of the month of design, this is coming not just from the university from, but from Design Core as well. Keeping the, the guests down to maybe four people at a time and scheduling them as they come in to see these exhibits, um, really making sure that we're keeping the amount of people that enter our building down. All right. Would, uh, in a non-pandemic situation, how many people would come into your building typically? Oh, um, depending on what we were doing, there are there are times. I mean, we've had third-party events where we would have 200 people in the in in our space at one time, and we have. The ground floor gallery and then we have um, so, uh, the second floor so we have quite a few areas for people to congregate um, so yeah we could have up to a couple hundred people depending on what's going on but typically um, just the students and maybe some meetings some co-working things like that uh, we're about out of time here for this segment so why don't you give folks the uh, web address once again for the yeah what Lester said all of those activities sure it's detroit.design backslash Lester. If you don't remember the Lester part, it's in the header so you can see it. Um, and you just pull down, you'll see all of the information this coming Thursday, July 16th at 4.30. We are having our, our, our artist talk. You can sign up for that and be part of that. Again, it's virtual, it's streaming online. I will send you the information. It's just one click and you get on. It's so easy. And then you can meet the artists and hear what they have to say and then look at all of the other um, events that we have coming up towards the end of the month and in August. All right, sounds good. Andrea Bogart, manager of the Lawrence Technological University College of Architecture and Designs, Detroit Center for Design and Technology. Thanks for being with us today. You Thank get you. all that on one business card? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm hard. impressed. I'm impressed. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, this is the M Squared TechCast, uh, MITechnews.tv. We'll be back in exactly one minute. For right now, it's Matt Rausch and Mike Brennan. And we'll be right back with more of the M Squared TechCast.
What do you get at Lawrence Thanks, Technology everybody. University? Thank you so much. Great labs and studios, okay. supportive professors, a good quick change, by the way. NAIA athletics, and all the software you need to succeed. Be smart. Be there more. At LTU, oh, all dressed up today. is everything. Salaries of Lawrence Tech grads are among the highest of any university think, right? in America. Oh, yeah. Run yes. a campus visit to the, the counselors, today. faculty, oh, and oh. coaches. I wait. Find out more <laughs> at LTU. Edu. <laughs> As a Lawrence Technological University graduate, you're not only marketable, you're worth more. Are you guys waiting? Yes, more. According uh, to we're on commercial. Com, when it comes okay. to graduate hours, more seconds. LTU is in America's top 100. Well, about the epidemiology survey. More. At LTU, possible is everything. Salary of Lawrence Tech grad that are among the yep. highest of any university in the world. Plan a campus visit to uh, meet with counselors, faculty, and coaches. How do you see Why Michigan wait? Find out? out more at ltu.edu. Hey, hey, it's Matt Roche. We're going to get this down one of these days. And Mike Brennan. <laughs> <laughs> we're used to being in the studio next to each other, right? right. Uh, and we have, once again, we have calling in uh, Fred Brown, our, our infectious disease expert, our epidemiologist, our answer to Dr. Fauci, you know, so, uh, and uh, he works with John Hopkins, he works with, uh, gosh, a whole bunch of states and countries, and on this very topic is how do we deal with or what's happening next in the COVID pandemic, and so uh, it's been two weeks since we talked, and you were warning people before, but don't think about carefully what you do on the 4th of July holiday. And unfortunately, it appears a lot of people did not do that. And nope. <clears throat> they're spiking again, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. We, you know, the whole Midwest sort of went like this, then kind of uh, around middle of June, things were going good. And then all of a sudden, it's just uh, all come back up again on right. us, uh, uh, after Memorial Day and a few big uh, happy events. And all of a sudden, we're back on track to go up. We're not as bad as south as the southeast, southwest, and California, though. Those guys never stopped. And they, they just went like this the whole time. Well, Florida, they just had some enormous number of cases yesterday. 15,000 a day? Yeah, right. Yeah, it's, just, it's amazing. Yeah, that, and that's a problem because it's an elderly population and, you know, the virus is just sitting there waiting to find the victims and it will. And, uh, they're going to have some real suffering down there and in Arizona, especially uh, in, in the next three weeks. We're hoping, you know, the models indicate that people are starting to get aware and, and despite the fact the government isn't responding quite as quickly as we were hoping uh, that, that uh, people are, are going to take it, will take it on themselves to pull back a little bit. So we're hoping that in three weeks or so, the new case rate will come down slightly, but it's plateauing at such a high level. We've never, you know, if you do the math, and they did it recently, um, they took out New York and New Jersey. And you know what happens if you take out New York and New Jersey out of the United States equation? You know, right now it looks sort of like this, right? It went like this. If you take yeah. out New York and New Jersey, it just goes like this. We, yeah. we have never really had a chance to control the virus. Um, and by control, I mean the sort of getting to an in, uh, getting to being able to do individual care plans. We're always working at the population level, always worried about overwhelming the, the hospitals. And when that happens, you know, the death rates just go, you know, two to fourteen times what they what they are normally. Unfortunately, even so. Really so what did what did other um, relatively wealthy industrialized countries do that we didn't to get this under control? Ha! Huh. <laughs> well, there were kind of three strategies. You know, if you if you look at the three strategies, there was. A containment strategy and the guys in the in North Asia did that really well. So if you look at China, Taiwan, Taiwan probably had the best, you know, Taiwan had what they're right next to sitting right next to China. They have lots of visitors going in and out all the time. They never trusted the Chinese much. And so they were really, in 2002, with, SARS, with the SARS epidemic, they were really focused on trying to control epidemic. They only had two, 407 outbreaks, uh, 407 cases and seven deaths. So that's, mm -hmm. that's sort of a world record for, for a country of 20, 20 plus million. Uh, so, uh, so they did it really well. What they did, though, is they had very good contact tracing. They, 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 they had a lot of testing. They centralized all their testing. That's one thing we haven't done for, as effectively in the United States. We haven't created scale. And what we, we have one of the great healthcare systems in the country, but it's very decentralized. And the trick in epidemics and to, to treat pandemics is to get the scale together, get certain things in place, uh, and make sure that you don't, you don't run short of testing especially and we uh unfortunately broke that apart our ppe uh pipelines were all individual states our testing pipelines all became individual states I mean, meant two things number one we never understood aggregate demand so we never were able to kind of get the demand right for our 
for our some of our great manufacturing organizations like 3M, a good signal for aggregate demand. Uh, and second, we keep having to go through learning curves of how to manage um, uh, exponential growth. So that's one of the new big things. You know, if you're a manager, you sort of sit back and say, you know, I better wait and take a look and see and think about this problem for a little while before I you know, make such a critical decision. It turns out that when you're having a pandemic and you were going through exponential growth, if you wait a day, it can mean doubling the next day, doubling the problem and so on. And unfortunately, you know, if you learn that once <laughs> at a national level, instead of 50 times at the, at the state level, it can really make a difference. And we're, unfortunately, the governors are each indiv learning individually, oh my gosh, this is a little bit of a different problem than I'm used to. And so I'm, I'm, I'm talking to like 17 states right now and every one of them has that problem. You know, supply chains that are disaggregated and demand that's, uh, that, that the signals aren't, aren't, aren't are, are appropriately put together. And the second thing is that, that learning curve where, oh my gosh, I waited a day and now I got twice as many cases as I thought. Mm. Now, one of the governors that seems to be handling it well, and I'm not doing an endorsement for her, just an a, a observation, is our own governor, uh, Governor Whitmer. So, however, that being said, uh, she's kind of threatening to maybe crack back down again because the R is going up, right? Yeah, you know that. Um, so it's interesting when I first did the modeling. So first of all, I don't work work with uh, with Governor Whitmer. Uh, she, I, I still think she's doing a bit, one of the top, kind of a top ten job uh, in in the country when you look at the states. So you look at fifty states, you know, she's in the top ten definitely. And and uh, I wish I was working with her, but I'm I, I, I'm not. So full disclosure. But uh, it's interesting when I first started modeling the the virus. Um, one of the best modelers in the world I worked with in the past was a guy who helped me control H H one N. The, the, the H5N1 disease uh, worldwide. And what we did is we actually looked at the R, 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 R0. And um, I, I decided to run this model for four weeks before I put it on GitHub. Now it's part of GitHub and it's part of the natural, part of a, a lot of the discussions that we have, uh, it's called R, R, RT Live. Uh, but that, that's basically our program. And I called up my, my friend, uh, Luis Bentoncourt, who's probably one of the best modelers in the world, period. He works at Los Alamos now. He's in Chicago. He's, he's has joint positions. He's got, you know, multiple PhDs and so on. Um, and he told me, yeah, that's the nature of this virus. I, I said, Luis, I'm worried about the fact that, you know, I'm coming down. I started at, you know, RTs of five, three in some states. I'm coming down. I'm hitting one. And, I, and, and when I hit one, it goes down and then it comes back up again. It comes down, comes back up. And I'm, I'm sort of hovering around one. I can't consistently get below below one for long periods of time. He said, it's not a problem with the, with, the, with the model. It's actually the nature of this disease. We have so many asymptomatic patients and, we're, and our testing is so... Is, is not robust enough to detect those asymptomatics. And so what happens is that as soon as you let up just slightly, uh, and that's that natural tendency to say, hey, I'm below R, R, R1, and so I, I'm below you know, an R0, so an, R, an RT of one, I'm doing great. You open up slightly and all of a sudden the thing bounces back on you. Uh, and so it turns out that in almost all the models we're using right now, without doing some lockdowns in the, in, in, in the outbreak areas, and it doesn't have to be the whole state, doesn't have to be the whole nation, but certainly in the outbreak areas, if you don't lock down uh, when you have outbreaks, you can't control the virus uh, on a national level. And that's what we're seeing right now, sadly, with just sort of the, the nature of the virus and the fact that uh, it has a high death rate, it has a high, sentiment, uh, has a high transmission rate, you know, spreads through, through the air, human to human, it's about as bad as you can get, right? Uh, and, and it lasts a long time. You know, with flu, you're, you know, you're, you're one and done after, you know, a, a four or five days. Here, you, you're, you're hanging on for 28 days, then people actually who even are, quote unquote, resolved, 53% uh, of them still have lingering effects of the virus and we have little pops of, of continued viral shedding even after you know a month, two months, three months. It's sort of, it'll flatten out and then pop up again. And people have kind of thought that's a reinfection. It's not a reinfection, it's actually a hybrid, it's actually a, you know, a sequestering of the virus and then re-popping up a bit uh, that we think right now is, is the case. So a lot of issues with this virus, it's, it's super, it's, it's gonna be hard to control. Let's talk a little bit more about Michigan. Uh, so yeah. Michigan is still okay, relatively speaking, vis-a-vis -vis the other states. However, it's coming back up. What would you recommend the governor do? We're hopefully not back into that drastic lockdown we had before. Yeah, I hope we can avoid that. Uh, what other states have done is, a, so first of all, it's, it's unfortunately, we still don't have any effective therapeutics and effective vaccines. All we can really do is manage our own behaviors and 
we do have a couple of facts. You know, the fact is that we have this non-pharmaceutical intervention. This is sort of like medieval ages. We don't have anything we can do here. There's no magic. Or something, no. Right? So yeah, so it's it's all about distancing and hand hand washing slash hygiene uh, and a mask. So we know that masks are about six times more effective for transmission uh, than, than, than that. Uh, and we also know that outside is about 18 times more effective than, uh, more safe than inside. So the thing that really drives the viral pieces that, that, Dr., that, that, that the Governor Whitmore has to watch for are, are number one, is an indoor or ex, uh, outdoor activity. Number two is, does it exert you so that you've got to physically exhale a lot? And three, does it attract crowds? Uh, and, and four, what is the general level of COVID in our community? So when you have community spread and the community level is high, uh, then you really have to start to be careful of those kinds of events even more so than in others. So, you know, much more testing, much more contact tracing, you know, kill it, in, uh, you know, kill it at the head in advance because so much of this uh, viral transmission is what they call front end loaded. You don't even know you've got the disease. So it's pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic patient uh, groups that are basically spreading this disease. Uh, and they just don't know they have the disease uh, or they come down with it, you know, to, and by that time they've already, you know, gone to a big party and, and infected 50 people. So th that, that's what's really what she has to watch for and making societal decisions about what are the priorities. You know, is it more important for us, you know, to have uh, a, 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 a big football game or a big rally of some kind, uh, or do we want to, or, or, you know, to have our bars all open or uh, do we want to, you know, uh, have our schools open? You know, those, those are those are big questions. Well, that's actually a good segue because that was oh. going to be my next question. Except uh, it. <laughs> as you know, the uh, Trump administration, led by Betsy DeVos, one of our own here in Michigan, is yes. advocating that the K through 12 schools open, as in go back to normal. And we're like a month or and a half, month and a half away from that happening. What would you recommend? Wow. It, this is a really, really tough one. You know, uh, uh, so the, the issue we've got is that statistically 16% of our workforce, if, you, if we don't let the children go back to school or give them some daycare, they can't work. You know, and probably when we have our kids at home now, we're starting to see the level of productivity. You know, people have done their own surveys, I'm sure, but I would guess that you probably lose a couple hours, you know, depending how old your kids are and so on, what they're doing. You probably lose a couple hours a day of, of, of productivity. Now you probably make that up, you know, with extra work, you know, lunch hours and not having to do the commute and so on. But it is really, really hard. And as, as people, you feel like their children are falling behind in school and they're not making the social contacts that they want to make, that things are, are just abnormal and that's already un un uncomfortable. But there's a big push to get people back to, back, back to, um, back to school. Uh, we've done some work on this. Um, the couple, there are a couple of things that are really critical. Number one is that every place is a little bit different, right? The UP uh, doesn't have quite the level of viral load as, as, as others. Uh, so there's a geographic question you've got to answer about how big is the, vi is, is the virus, how active is the virus in that area. And, you know, the, the, the traditional areas that are, have a lot of trouble, sadly, are most populated ones, Kent County, Wayne, Oakland, Macomb, uh, Washtenaw. Those are, those are kind of our troubled and challenged, most challenged counties, and they also have the biggest populations. In those instances, I would recommend that they try to at least try to go and stagger uh, the, the school so that you've got a group of kids who are going in the morning, stop, afternoon, stop. Uh, you might wanna, uh, and, and you might wanna focus the, the, the teaching more uh, where we find students have the biggest setbacks are in arithmetic and in reading. Uh, and there, those things should probably be, de be done, especially for the younger students, you know, face to face, so they don't fall back in those two crit more, more critical areas. Other areas, we find that they can catch up, but in those areas of, of math and, and math, especially in reading and somewhat, uh, they fall back more. So it, it, to the extent that you can supplement that more is better. Um, you know, the challenge is, are going to be not so much, I think, uh, in, in, in through October, but after Nove October, November, uh, we can't have outdoor classrooms anymore. We're going to have to go back inside. And that's where it really gets tricky. And uh, they've done a big study at Yale, and they looked at university level students. Uh, and they, they feel that if, if we do not you know, have a way of testing students who are living, now these are people who are living together and so on, uh, at least twice um, uh, twice a week, 
uh, that uh, they, uh, I'm sorry, every two days that they will definitely have an outbreak in almost every university setting they have that they've, they've simulated. So that, that's- I, I was, yeah, I was that, gonna say, how, how many tests are we doing a day now as a nation and how many should we be doing? <laughs> as, as a nation, we, well, so, so President Trump says we've done, we've you know, tested 40 million people. That actually isn't quite right because most of uh, the people are tested more than once, especially if, you're, if you have the disease, you know, you, you, you'll be tested four or five times a day to understand viral load levels. So a lot of these, t I think I would guess that probably we've, we've tested 30 million people and that's, that, that's less than 10% uh, of our total population. Uh, the WHO recommends that we test um, to a point of getting 5% positive rates. Right now, on, on average in the United States, we're at 8.6% positive rates. So mm -hmm. even the WHO standards, which are far be below what we'd expect and what, what generally, you know, lesser developed countries are following, we're probably at half the level of testing than we should be. Uh, and my, in my estimation, um, right now, uh, we are just getting to, I believe, about 500,000 we're, 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 I'm sorry, our goal was 500,000 tests a day uh, as a first step. You know, we're, so we're going up 500,000 tests. We're, about, we're, we're at best, at best, half that rate. Hmm. Uh, and, and in Michigan, we are at about that rate. The problem is that epidemiologists talked about 500,000 a day as a plateau on a, on a move to get to 4 million a day, which they think is absolute minimum to actually control the virus. And hmm. in my estimation, if we are trying to control outbreaks, we actually have to have about 20 million tests a day. So uh, where are we on the test kits? Is that the bottleneck? There's not enough test kits or what? Or the reagents. So we have test kits. The problem is we don't have the assemblage of the reagents plus the little sample bottles and so on. So mm -hmm. we're trying to get to a point of doing what they call point of care testing. Right now we have we have a uh, we have big uh, uh, we have we have big PCR tests which are central lab run and and we unfortunately we really haven't deployed our tests very effectively we've only uh, we've only actually um, got about a third of the testing capability and capacity we have out there right now for example Germany started to uh, turn on all of its veterinary labs and they did a great job in under in moving from human testing to, from from animal testing to human testing we have not really penetrated the university testing laboratories we haven't penetrated the the private testing laboratories as much as we should have so we've got a big capacity in the united states to do a lot more we just haven't pushed hard enough and in order to do that i think we have to probably be a lot much more forceful at the national level uh, but, get, but getting back well, I to think, I, I, one thing one thing i wanted to mention to you fred was that i think it's going to be real interesting to see what happens to the caseload in northern Michigan about two weeks after the 4th of July? Because I, oh, <clears throat> I was up there on the 4th of July, and my wife and I uh, were in a cabin, you know, sort of you know, social distancing and all that, and we tried to go to a beach on July 5th, okay? So we went oh. up to Sleeping Bear Dunes, oh, and, we, yes. and, and we went to the, yeah, we went to the end of, of Point, you know, we went to Point Betsy. It was I know just where you were. With people, jammed with people. We went to a little ghost town uh, at the end of Esh Road in Benzie County, where I know that there's a beach that is frequently deserted, or at least it used to be, jammed full of people. We went to the next beach down the road, jammed full of people, and we wound up going back to our cabin, and we didn't go to a beach, because I didn't want to be part of a crowd that big. I mean, I, I, what were they wearing masks? Was any masks? Oh, heck no. no it's Yeah, I mean, hardly any. It, it, it was insane. I, I just... It's going to be really interesting to me because, you know, where we were staying in Benzie County, they are at eight cases, zero fatalities. Now, granted, it's only a county of 17,000 people, but still, you know, it'll be really interesting to see what happens to that in a couple of weeks. Luckily, so I just wanted to get that out there. <laughs> Luckily, it was outdoor and sunny, so you, it's, it's a, it's a, there's a less of a chance. If it was a, like a mall or something, a Christmas shopping, then you're going oh, to yeah. see it. Good. Imagine that. Yeah. Hey, let me ask you too, Fred. How are we doing on uh, hospital uh, utilization, as it were, the beds here in Michigan? Have any idea on that? Are we? Is that under control? According to the national surveys, about what we like to see, which is about sixty-five percent uh, uh, utilization, we are actually at slightly higher than that. So we are considered a yellow right now as far as hospital utilization, bed utilization, ICU capacity in the state overall. Uh, it, it, it varies from hospital to hospital, obviously, and I think we can probably transport patients more effectively than some of the other states can uh, in the more populated areas. But we're at, we're, we're considered a yellow, which is a high, you know, which considered warning. We're not at red yet. Florida certainly is over red at this point. Oh, yeah, I imagine, yeah. <laughs> yeah Texas too. Parts of Texas, Texas anyway. Texas, Arizona, California, LA area are all way over. 
And then uh, also, uh, what's the status of vaccine development? I know everybody in the world is trying to come up with a vaccine, but are we any closer than we were? So vaccine, on a worldwide basis, there are five big competitors, right? The U.S., we've got probably the most, we have definitely the most vaccines uh, that, are, that are being proposed. Uh, we've, we've organized them into something called the Project Warp Speed, uh, where we're trying to accelerate four or five projects that we think are really strong uh, versus the rest of the country, the rest of the world. And what we've done in each of those cases is we have invested uh, so that we are guaranteed the first 300 million doses. Uh, which kind of ticks off the rest of the world, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, on the other end, if we get something good uh, and we have a limited number of doses, our, our, you know, we'll, 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 we'll have a chance to vaccinate the United States. Uh, other big, the next big area is the UK. They are also kind of with us with AstraZeneca Oxford Biosciences. Uh, we've each invested uh, about slightly over a billion dollars, and the UK also is going to get 100 million doses, which then they have a 66.4 million uh, population. So they also have enough on reserve for themselves and some of the Commonwealth uh, affiliates. Uh, then we have Europe. Europe has a, a, a group of consortia, which in, includes the Gates Foundation and, and, uh, and um, uh, CEPI is the big, is a big operation. It's a $36 billion operation that, that, that they've asked, asked for. And what they've done, they've decided it a little bit different. They said, we will manufacture, we will give you this money, but you've got to manufacture doses for the world at a very cheap price. So what they've done is they've actually negotiated price rather than volume. Uh, and so Europe would get uh, their their vaccine for two dollars and fifty cents, about two dollars fifty euro per dose. We have not okay. we have not requested that. And finally, then there's China. China has the most advanced uh, actually has the most advanced vaccine. They're actually in, injecting their their military with it already. Are we cooperating with China in terms of developing the vaccine? Well, CanSino is the one developing the vaccine. It's Canadian and, and, and Chinese uh, operation. Uh, China uh, sees, sees this much more as a public good than we do. So they actually, about a third of their operation is, uh, is, is, a, is academic slash uh, not-for-profit, only about 10% of, of the U.S. is in, in, in that realm. So they actually have, um, you know, it, now, they have 1.2 billion people to vaccinate. So, you know, uh, so that, that's, there, yes. <laughs> or I thought even more than that now. So uh, they, they've got a lot, they've got a lot higher hurdle to climb than 300 million. Uh, we're basically a rounding error for that <laughs> compared right. to what they've got to produce. And so my guess is that they will be quite, um, so they generally, they're looking at, at, a, at a vaccine that's going to be more appropriate for younger people. The challenge with the vaccine we've got is that most of our deaths are people over 60, 60 and 65. That, 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 population is extremely difficult to vaccinate appropriately. Uh, our, uh, I'm, I'm in that category and unfortunately our immune system is already a little bit out of whack. And so uh, when you give a vaccine, there are a lot of uh, side effects that aren't, aren't anticipated. You don't, the dosing is quite difficult. Uh, the duration of the vaccines ch ch challenging and so on. And so I think that they're gonna have something that's much more appropriate for a younger population. And uh, we're trying to develop something that's much more appropriate for healthcare workers and, and, and people who are at a higher risk. Let me also ask, uh, eventually we hope to have this pandemic under control whenever that might be, but what's the likelihood that, then that another mutation will come along in the future and do another pandemic, although it obviously would be different in some way, I mean, have we opened the door? Is it, is it more? Is this the new normal? Uh, yeah, this is the new normal for about. So it's interesting that the head of of BioNTech, uh, who is the partner with Pfizer, uh, announced that they plan to have a vaccine available in December. So he said, "Great news! We are will have a vaccine available in December, and that's uh, you know Pfizer. So it's uh, probably probably accurate within uh, you know within their knowledge at this point." Um, uh, and he said, at the same time, we will not control this virus for 10 years. Oh, God. Yeah. So that, that, that uh, and that's the kind of discussion I have among with my virology, epidemiology friends. We don't see a real control of this virus for 10 plus years. What that means is that we're going to be using partially, uh, partial solutions. We'll be, we'll be wearing masks for a lot longer than we plan to. Uh, and that these partial solutions unfortunately are sus very susceptible to rationing and shortages, right? Because you're suddenly taking a package of pills, a package of vaccines all coming together. Some of them are very effective for people who are you know, surviving based on those things. And you can imagine that if suddenly one of those becomes in short supply, they're gonna pay, pay any price to get it. 
uh, and, the, and the, that, that rationing becomes highly political, very challenging and very, and, and quite fragile. So there's gonna be a, a lot of challenges with this particular, uh, uh, with, this, with this pandemic. And unfortunately, you know, University of Michigan just did a survey of 18 countries, 20,000 people. The average person in the world today, and this is true everywhere in the world with the exception of four countries, one of them is Canada, but certainly not true in the United States, is that 90% of us feel that this fact will be quote unquote safe in the, in the new normal in, within six months. Hmm. And uh, I, I will tell you that is impossible. Uh, based on you know, where, where we are right now. We, we, I think we're going to get some effective therapeutics. Uh, They're going to, again, be partially uh, effective, some effective antibiotics, uh, antibodies, excuse me, um, and some partially effective antivirals, which like in, in, in AIDS are quite expensive, are all hospital-based, uh, and uh, are, are cocktails that are partially effective. Eventually, we'll get to full suppression, I think, in probably seven or eight years. And then I think we'll have partially effective vac vaccines that you know, we'll, we'll probably give some people a little bit of prophylactic therapy for periods of time, but not be something that's fully effective and certainly not for the general population. Um, uh, for, and that, that will take probably a period of 10 years until we get a really truly effective, what they call sanitizing vaccine for the general public. public. So big, big spectator events, whether they're indoor or outdoor, uh, not looking good, right? Indoor are a lot worse. I, I think, uh, well, so University of Michigan is, I, I shouldn't, I, you know, large, large universities have done the, done the math. Basically, you know, in a place like the big house, you, can, you might be able to get and continually socially distance up to 40,000 fans, which is a lot of fans. The problem is you got to get them in and out of the stadium and you got to get them to socially distance while they're waiting in line for their, for all the chips and snacks and, and fun things. And then you've got a lot of the, the people who are the most important donors, but uh, especially are, are in skyboxes, and those are very dangerous. Yeah, well, you've been to a U of M football game. You know what it's we like. Love it. I love it. I was going to say, all, all, all of a sudden, it's you don't want the right box anymore. Yeah, all, all of a sudden, you don't want the skybox anymore, huh? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, th those prices should come down a little bit. <laughs> yeah, those are expensive little buggers. The ones that are on midfield are $100,000 a year or something like Yikes. that. You know, so. Yeah, for six games or seven games. Huh? Okay, well. So I, th I think we'll be able to so – the, the real challenge with sports is that – Athletes are, are exerting themselves, they're breathing on each other, they're facing each other, there's a mix. They, it's impossible to manage them off the field, as, as, even in bubbles, even professional athletes, you know, already, you know, in soccer, they had an outbreak of 40 soccer players in Europe coming down with something. And, and, and baseball, I think we've got a team of about, again, about 40 players who are suddenly uh, have, 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 the, have, the, have COVID, uh, COVID positive. It just... It's just so hard to do this right, right? You're, you throw around the ball, you know, you strike someone out, you throw it around the horn, what happens? You get <laughs> you're spreading you're over every, the ball, every, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah pardon me a second while I sanitize the ball here. Yeah, yeah. that's not gonna work. Yeah. Yeah. Every time they throw it back to the pitcher, you'd have to put the sanitizer on it. That's right. <laughs> that's a, sounds like a spitball to me. I don't know about you guys. That's really oh, hard. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, un unfortunately, we're running out of time. So uh, if folks want to, uh, we, we archive uh, all these videos, and I know you do at fredbrown.com too, right? Yes. Yes, please feel free to visit. We can see all the whole the whole show anytime. And next time we should talk about the epidemiologist view of this, because there's an interesting survey the epidemiologist conducted versus kind of the, the Joe on the street versus what the epidemiologist would do with, with certain activities. I think you'd be finding it interesting. So maybe we can all right, let's plan on that for next week then. Ah, beautiful. Okay, we'll thanks a lot, Fred Brown. We want to thank Fred for being with us today. Thank all of our guests today. Andrea Bogart of the Detroit Center for Design and Technology at Lawrence Technological University. And we started the show with uh, Enrico Schaefer, uh, one of our favorite lawyers, talking about his uh, class action class action lawsuit. <laughs> against Airbnb, Airbnb, yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. Well, Mike, we'll be back next Monday at 2 p.m. Eastern time um, with a, a great show for you. And uh, until then, this is Matt Rausch. And Mike Brennan. And you've been watching the M Squared TechCast. Thanks, Fred. Hey, pleasure. I'm sorry. I did. I, I saw all the notes and I, I, I was trying to uh, put some things together for the slideshow, but we never even got to it. So. <laughs> well, we, can, we can save it for next week, right? Yeah, we're ready for next That's week. That's perfectly absolutely. fine. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, do you guys have a good time up north? Yeah, we did. We, uh, um, we were with my... Um,
my wife's brother and his wife for the first four nights, and I know they've been super careful careful because she's immune compromised, so they've been really careful. And so we've been careful and, and you know, taking our temperatures twice a day and all that good stuff. Um, but so we could still be pre-symptomatic, who knows, but as far as we know, we were fine. So it was, it's, it was just us uh, in a little cabin on the uh, uh, Platte River. And then we went farther north up to a little lake